Well, um, good morning or uh, good afternoon if you've already got there, wherever you happen to be uh, around the world. Um, and welcome to this uh, first Parkinson's uh, webinar from the Parkinson's Academy. Um, so we're all getting to be quite proficient Zoomers now. Um, we're accepting that increasingly this is the new normal for meetings, at least for the time being. Um, we recognise it's maybe not quite as good as traditional meetings. Um, it does have some advantages. Uh, it allows us to gather together an international panel, which we have, uh, as well as an international audience, perhaps a bigger audience than one might normally uh, be able to access. So there are some advantages, although we, we recognise we miss the networking to some extent. Well, we're going to um, address the issue of the impact of, of COVID-19 uh, on Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease particularly. Just to broaden out for a moment, um, so far at least, it doesn't seem as though there is a major neurological signal associated with COVID-19. This is something that's on ongoing surveillance. There's a little bit of a signal, perhaps uh, uh, increased stroke, perhaps, COVID-19 encephalopathy, there's a few case reports appearing, uh, but so far the direct effects of this virus appear to be predominantly lungs and to a lesser extent kidneys. But that's all very well for the direct effects. Um, we're very aware that the, both the disease and the way that most of the world is trying to cope with it uh, is having indirect effects. Uh, and for all of us who have been doing phone clinics and remote clinics over the last few weeks, that's very apparent. Um, just before we launch into, our, into our, our speakers, I'll just, if you can cope with it, just a brief vignette was a, a, a phone consultation I had with a patient of mine, which I think summarizes very much some of the effects of this condition. So he's still a relatively young man. He's in his 60s. He's had Parkinson's disease since 1994. He's one of my longest running patients. Um, and he's been through everything effectively. Uh, he was one of the earliest DBS patients I had. He had DBS back in 2003. Um, inevitably, as time has gone by, things have got more difficult. And certainly in the last few years, balance and falling have become issues. Uh, and in the last year, he's been diagnosed with a PD associated dementia, although remains still uh, able to have a, a, a good conversation. And throughout all of it, he's been well supported by uh, a, 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 a very uh, engaged uh, wife. Um, and, and certainly, as his wife says, he spent much of the, the last few months more on the floor, perhaps, than actually upright through his, his falling. Um, but despite all of that, uh, one of the things that's kept him going is he still managed to get out uh, and he enjoys playing golf uh, in a fashion. Um, and yesterday we had a consultation when his wife said, despite nothing changing in his medication, uh, she, he was the worst she'd ever seen him in the last four weeks since the lockdown. And very perceptibly, she identified uh, that the problem uh, was uh, one uh, of lack of, in, la lack of contact, lack of, in, lack of engagement, and lack of golf, and, and that's something that certainly our first speaker uh, has written uh, quite perceptively about. So enough from me, let's go straight in uh, to our first speaker, Baz Bloom from Nijmegen. Um, Baz has very specifically uh, indicated that I'm not to give him a long, uh, tedious introduction, and I very much uh, agree with that. Everybody knows Baz. Um, I will hope I will not embarrass him by saying uh, that he's one of the top three neurologists that I enjoy listening to, pretty much on any subject, uh, but certainly anything to do with Parkinsonism. So Baz, over to you. Thank you. Well, Richard, that was the uh, most incredible introduction ever. Thank you so much. Curious to hear who the other two are, but that's for a separate occasion when uh, the one and a half meter society has vanished. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, with you and show you um, this PowerPoint presentation, I, which I hope you can now all see. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the hidden sorrows of the COVID crisis. And by hidden sorrows, I mean that we're obviously all concerned about the risk of becoming infected. There is no reason to assume that people with Parkinson's are at an increased risk of becoming infected. We do feel that if you do become infected, you are at an increased risk of sustaining the more severe complications, in particular the respiratory issues. And this is because Parkinson's itself um, already impacts on your respiratory system. So trying to avoid becoming infected uh, is critical. 
And that is sort of the immediate sorrow, but there's also a number of hidden sorrows uh, that come as a, um, as, as, a, as a side effect of this crisis. And my main disclosure is that I'm an author of this book and I'll just spend two minutes on the book uh, because I think it's important for all people with Parkinson's uh, in the world. Uh, what we're saying in this book, uh, which you can see here, it's called Ending Parkinson's Disease. And it's, it's what I hope is, is you will read a message of hope uh, in this book. Um, because we describe, on the one hand, that Parkinson's is the fastest growing neurological condition on the planet. That is a reality. It's growing faster than Alzheimer's. It's growing faster than stroke or any other condition on the planet. And um, we think this is at least in part because we owe Parkinson's to ourselves. We think Parkinson's is at least to an extent, just like the pyramids in Egypt, a man-made disease. Um, it relates to environmental pollution. You may remember the fact that James Parkinson in London described the disease in 1817 when the uh, Industrial Revolution took place in England. In China, where this picture was actually taken, um, the Industrial Revolution is now taking place and Parkinson's has doubled in the last 10 years in China. Another factor that we're particularly concerned about is uh, pesticides such as Paraquat, Paraquat has now been banned in over 60 countries in the world, including the United Kingdom uh, and in the Netherlands. But in the United States, for example, Paraquat is still widely used, as you can see in this graph. The United Kingdom is the number one exporter of Paraquat. Um, and this is something to think about. And in the Netherlands, on our tulip fields, every day we use the little sister of Paraquat, which is Paraquat with a minor chemical modification which has never been tested for toxicity in animals and we spray it on our fields every day day in day out and in our book we raise awareness for the fact that we as a society need to act to prevent our children our environment future generations the book is obviously also on better care for the millions of people affected by this disease worldwide um, we think we need more advocacy I genuinely think that people with Parkinson's are among the friendliest and nicest people on the planet, and I mean this very seriously. I've been impressed by the resilience uh, of people with Parkinson's. But you have maybe been too friendly. You may recall, and we describe this in the book, that people with HIV in the 80s literally chained themselves to the doors of the pharma companies and demanded more funding, demanded better treatments. And HIV in 20 years' time change from a deadly condition to a now treatable chronic condition. And I think we need that type of advocacy for Parkinson's. I'm not saying you should chain yourself to the wall, but I do think we need to utter our voice loudly, asking for more money to better understand the disease, to develop better treatments, and to clean our environment and to protect our future generations. So this is all in the book. Um, you can purchase the book here. And just so you know, uh, I'm not doing this to promote my own income. All proceeds go to Parkinson charities and to the purpose of eradicating Parkinson's from the planet. Um, so far, we've been hearing that it's a really good book, and uh, I hope uh, that you will enjoy it too. And so here it is. All the proceeds um, are devoted to our efforts to end Parkinson's. Now, the reason Neurology Academy invited me to speak is on this paper that received an expedited review in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease under the title Hidden Sorrows and Emerging Opportunities. And I think, as I alluded to in the introduction of my talk, in addition to the immediate threats of becoming infected, this COVID crisis comes with hidden sorrows. Um, one in particular is the fact that um, because this continuous threat is there, um, people experience stress. And we are increasingly interested in the fact that stress has at least two effects on people with Parkinson's. It acutely worsens your symptoms, all your folks with a tremor or maybe freezing of gait or maybe the dyskinesias, the involuntary movements, will know immediately that when you're just a little bit stressed, could be somebody observing you, could be work pressure, your tremor worsens, your gait worsens, your involuntary movements worsen. But there is all so concerns 
that chronic stress may lead to a worsening of the progression of your disease. So I think stress is something that needs to be taken seriously. And there are now fortunately remote options for, for example, yoga or mindfulness. Uh, reach out to Parkinson's UK or to other Parkinson patient societies that can hook you up with your fellow patients, with counselors to alleviate that stress. Chronic stress is bad news for people with Parkinson's. Try to deal with it, speak about it, and seek help for that. The other one is lifestyle. Um, people with Parkinson's, in order to mitigate the risk of becoming infected, uh, are now staying at home. And this means lack of physical activity. And I've dedicated half an active career to trying to prove that physical activity is critical for people with Parkinson's. It is now an evidence-based intervention that leads to suppression of your symptoms, just like pills do. Um, and that's why you should not just be in the left queue, but you should move to the right queue um, and not just be dependent on pills. Exercise works like a drug. It helps to suppress your motor symptoms, helps to improve your sleep, it strengthens your bones, improves your cardiac functioning. And we now have recent, very exciting new evidence to suggest that maybe, maybe exercise could help to slow down the progression of Parkinson's. Um, we have a paper in the Lancet Neurology to suggest that, and we have recent imaging data, brain scans made in people before and after exercise to show that you can uh, probably build plasticity, adaptive changes in your brain by exercising on a regular basis. And I recommend that you exercise on a daily basis because if you have to do it on a daily basis, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, there's no tomorrow, you'll have to do it. And the golden rule is do something that makes you pant, but still be able to maintain a conversation. That's the right dose. And finally, fortunately, um, telemedicine is now bringing these types of interventions closer into your home. Going to a gym is now more difficult, but for example, Parkinson's UK uh, brings exercise programs to you literally into your homes. Um, and there are virtual dance classes, virtual exercise classes. You can hop up and down the stairs or hop up and down in front of your television. Make sure you get your daily exercise for 30 minutes that makes you pant but still be able to maintain a conversation. Seek out for help with your Parkinson Patient Association in your country. They're wonderful and they're doing a miraculous job in bringing those types of interventions into your home. And this is just a link to Parkinson's UK. I've always been deeply impressed with their educational programs and their support for patients. Become a member of Parkinson's UK or another society in another country if you join from another country outside of England and make sure that you get the care that you deserve right into your homes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm delighted to, I, I didn't doubt it, but you're just as good virtually as, in, as, as, as live. Um, just, to, just to remind the audience, please feel free to, to come through with, with questions for Baz. We've got plenty of time now uh, for some questions, but I might start off, because one of, one of the many symptoms that, that Parkinson's people struggle, struggle with is apathy, um, which, which can sort of hinder the, exactly the, the very sensible points you were just making. Um, in your, is, I've always wondered whether actually exercise helps helped apathy in a, in a sort of slightly chicken and egg sort of, sort of problem. I mean, what, what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? It's a very good question. Apathy is the inability of patients to take initiatives and this is something that patients don't see as a big problem. It's the very core definition of apathy, but it drives the spouse and the family mad because the patient is sitting in the corner and just says, it's okay, I'm just fine doing nothing. Um, it's always important to separate apathy from depression, which may be difficult, particularly for the lay man's eye. And we know that exercise helps to combat depression. It wouldn't surprise me, but it's not evidence-based that regular exercise is also good for apathy. But if your spouse is apathetic, make sure that you are the one stimulating the regular exercise. Um, and the other important thing that I tell all my patients, and I'm telling you folks, don't blame your spouse. 
it's a symptom of the disease. It can drive you mad, this lack of initiative, but the patient is not to blame. It's a symptom of the disease. They never asked for it and it's debilitating. Yeah, no, no that's, that's, that's very helpful advice. So we, we've got a question come in, Baz. Um, so someone's asked, um, any recommendations for exercise for people with postural instability? Yep, that's a very good one. The trial that we published in the Lancet Neurology was actually anticipating on this question and we used stationary bicycles in the patient's home. A bicycle is particularly interesting because even patients with freezing of gait or balance impairment can still ride a bicycle. You can safely do it in your own home environment um, and you can gamify it by putting it either in front of the television and watch the football game or your favorite sitcom um, or cycle against other patients or a virtual opponent. Make sure that you make your exercise enjoyable. Um, there are even recumbent bicycles, just simply pedaling with your feet while you're sitting in your own chair. So it doesn't have to be a complete expensive stationary bicycle, but there are definitely, and hand bikes are also very good. It will crank up your heart rate, make you pant, and that's good. So there is definitely solutions for people with instability. And I, I, and I think I, I know the answer to this question, but, but, but just you, you, you're, it's very much aerobic exercise that you're, you're, you're advocating ra ra rather than the sort of more, more sort of, sort of gym-based stuff. Right. This is, this is an important addition. So yes, strength training is also important because people with uh, PD are at risk for developing weakness. Stretching is not bad, but in addition, you need that daily aerobic exercise, the panting bit, cranking up the heart rate on a daily basis. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and as you say, uh, the, the other effects on, on the, scale, the musculoskeletal system uh, is, is, is important. Um, not, not, another question coming through, which, which actually just dropped in my head as well. So what about people with cognitive impairment um, and, and, and exercise? How, how, how the, the, obviously, they, they represent some challenges similar to the apathy issue. So, so, so what about them? Yeah, so it works two ways. On the one hand, there is quite good evidence particularly outside the Parkinson field, that regular exercise helps to prevent the cognitive decline. So it's actually a treatment. Once obviously you have this cognitive decline, the burden for the spouse becomes greater. And I realize that Parkinson's is not a disease that you have just by yourself. Parkinson's affects families. But if there is cognitive decline, exercise remains as important uh, as it is for people without cognitive decline, but the burden is larger for the patient, the responsibility, and I always recommend seek professional help, find a physiotherapist who can alleviate some of that burden because you want to be a spouse and not the nurse of your partner, right? And I, I, I see how marriages sometimes are under some strain because the spouse, and it's wonderful they do it, and I, I, I deeply value that, but you want to be the, the loving partner and not just the, the carer, right? And Baz, can, can I ask you, in, 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 in the last few weeks in, 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 with your clinics, I mean, are, are you doing mainly telephone-based or are you, doing, are you doing Skype or FaceTime or combinations? I mean, I mean what, what would be your ideal way in, in, in the current yeah. non-ideal circumstances? So I, I would say the silver lining of this crisis is that it has brought forward in an accelerated fashion I, what I think is the future of care bringing Parkinson patients to the hospital is wrong in the large majority of cases. As many of the folks on the line will recognize, is you come to the clinic, you've got bad freezing of gait at home, and you walk miraculously well in the clinic. And I've literally had these moments where the spouse would say, come on, John, freeze, show it to the doctor, only to freeze again on the parking lot on the way back to the car. And response fluctuations, the variations in the treatment response, are typically something you cannot capture in your 10, 15 minutes in the clinic. So what we're seeing now is that telemedicine has been brought forward in an accelerated fashion. Reimbursement is now in place in many countries. And I think a lot of the care can be delivered right into the patient's homes. A telephone can suffice in a number of cases, but I do feel that video conferencing brings you some extra information. You get to see into the living room, you get to see the facial expression, you get to see the interaction between the spouse and the patient. So I would recommend to people, try to familiarize yourself with video consultations, try to persuade your doctor to turn to video consultations, and don't worry that your care will be worse. There is in fact scientific evidence that care 
delivered into your home through telemedicine is at least as good, but it's much more efficient. Yeah, and, and you make an interesting point there. I mean, that this 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 de desire for change, which I think we'll we'll come back to later. I'm sure, I know Francesca's going to talk about this uh, as, as as well. This desire of change is 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 is, is or should be patient driven as, as much as anything else. And the other comp point you make, which I, which Louise will will recognise in in just a moment. Of course, that that's what our PD nurses see, as you as you say, going into patients' homes and just seeing how they're actually living and all that stuff that we sitting in our hospital clinics never get uh, at all and tells you so much more about it. And I, and I guess you're absolutely right. That, that's what comes across virtually. So, so, so yes, I mean, I mean, no one's suggesting that this pandemic is a good thing, but, but like all bad things, some good will hopefully come of it. And that may be, may be, may be one issue. Just, just before we, we pass over, Buzz, what, one, one other question I would, that's just popped up here is uh, any, any tips about how you might assess uh, symptoms like bradykinesia and rigidity uh, remotely. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. So um, the Movement Disorder Society is, is working on this, but we increasingly notice that a large part of the neurological exam can in fact be performed remotely. The tapping test for bradykinesia, as I'm showing now, or these movements can be done in front of the camera. Tremor can be shown. Gait becomes a little bit more iffy if, 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 if there's instability. But many symptoms and rigidity, of course, you have to feel the patient. But if you wiggle the shoulders like this and your arms swing, you can notice the asymmetry in the rigidity. But when you hold the legs, when you're seated on a chair and your feet are dangling and you move the legs passively and they swing until they stop, you can also notice the asymmetry in rigidity. So it's, it's surprising how much of Parkinson's can in fact be assessed remotely. Not all of it, but a large chunk. And by the way, when I see follow-up patients in my clinic, I spend 98% of my time talking to people and 2% examining them. The examination is important in establishing the diagnosis in a new patient. Yeah. After you've had the diagnosis, the exam becomes less and less important. And, 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 and that and, and the sort of allied question that's just come through, and, and that is that question about, which you partly answered, but, but, but the, the, the new patient, the first time you meet the patient, um, I don't know what your view is, but I mean, I mean, I, 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 I still tend to think that ideally that would should be live. Um, uh, virtual is, is is a sort of sort of second best, and, and maybe you know for, for for certain situations okay. But I'd be interested in your view about that. Yeah, absolutely. So we are seeing our new patients uh, by necessity uh, remotely now, but we are planning a follow up physical examination for two reasons. Uh, to distinguish Parkinson's disease from one of the forms of atypical Parkinsonism is a refined task. Uh, subtleties that cannot be brought out in a video consultation. The other important element is, although remote telemedicine is more uh, efficient, you do miss some of the intimacy. And without exaggerating, I do try to become friends with my patients. Not really friends, you can't be real friends, but... I value the intimacy with my patients. I need to put my hands on their knees, yeah. hug them, sometimes weep with them, and you can't do that remotely. But once I've invested in that personal relationship, then remote medicine becomes effective. But you can't do it exclusively remotely. So new patients, absolutely, we need to see them. Yeah. And, I, I, and I think, I think that, uh, that, that, that answers that one of the, the comments that's just come up as well, which, which, which is the comment, um, of course, that, that, that many of our patients, many Parkinson's patients um, are, are elderly and, and there are other parts of the examination apart from the nervous system. Um, so I think, I think, I think, I think we're, we're, we're all agreeing on that, but I think, I think you're absolutely right. A, a big chunk of follow-up uh, can certainly be done uh, sort of remotely. One last question that's just come in, which is an interesting one. Yes, what, what, what about cognitive assessment remotely? Yeah, um, there are validated uh, questionnaires so what we're finding, for example, in our research is that a lot of our um, um, assessments for, for clinical trials have been paused. But uh, if one thing can continue, it's the cognitive assessments because we have validated scales that have in fact been validated for either self-completion without supervision or that can be completed with a video consultation under supervision. Not all of them, some require equipment, uh, but many tasks can be done in fact remotely so the cognitive assessment can be done remotely 
Baz, thanks very much. That's a, a, an excellent start to, uh, to, to, to our webinar. Um, we're just going to slightly shift perspective now uh, and uh, cross over to uh, Louise Ebenezer, and it, and it is indeed Louise, rather, rather than how her first name is unfortunately uh, misspelled uh, in front of you there. So uh, Lu Louise, is, uh, as many of you will know, is a very experienced uh, nurse specialist in Parkinson's disease uh, and based uh, in Bridgend. Um, and if for those of you who are not very familiar with your Welsh geography, that's South Wales and just about more or less midpoint, I think, Louise, between uh, Swansea in the west and Cardiff in the east, more or less, just, 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 just up, up here, the M4 that connects those two cities. Um, so Louise is going to give us, is, is, is going to sort of talk very much about the, 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 the nursing perspective uh, in these difficult times. Louise, thank you. Hi, um, thank you for that introduction, um, Richard. I'm just going to talk about um, the situation we're in now from a nursing perspective, and it's my personal view um, of what's been happening. So I'm looking at the impact on patients and nurses, and what will you notice is there's fear in both the columns and anxiety. The patients are extremely fearful. We've got a massive amount of increased anxiety from patients who live alone, but also the, those who live with their spouses. Um, and on the following slides, I'll go into how we're managing those symptoms. The loneliness and isolation, and I'll give you a little story about one of my ladies. She's been with us now for um, the last four years. She's recently moved into the area. And I've been doing all my, my um, clinic consultations via the telephone. And when I rang her, she said, I'm so relieved to have a telephone call because nobody contacted her. She's um, 80. She was going to do her own shopping. She was collecting her own medication um, and knew she should be self-isolating, but didn't know how to. So obviously, um, in my role, I put her in touch with people who could do a shopping from the local voluntary organisation and the pharmacy were too pleased to um, deliver her medication. The problem is her family live in Switzerland. Um, and they couldn't get online shopping slots for her for, for another month. So that was the biggest problem for her. Um, but Parkinson's UK and our local information support worker has been amazing, Dallas Pritchard, and has run this lady as and when she wants to have a chat um, to help with her loneliness and isolation. Low mood is particularly problematic for our patients. And one of my, one of my patients said, to me, look, Louise, what we've got to think of, we've got to just stay in our own home and be safe. And that's all we can do and try and have a positive um, outcome on, on, on this awful situation. Unfortunately, I have come across an abusive relationship where somebody's personality has changed completely because he's not going to respite to the day centre that he goes three times a week. Him and his wife are in the house alone all of the time, except for when the carers come to get him up in the morning and put him to bed. So his tone, his attitude, the words that he's been calling his wife have been really very unpleasant. He started being very nice to the carers, but as the weeks have gone on, he's been quite abusive to those as well. So obviously we've got mental health involved. Um, and that's what we've noticed in our health board, mental health referrals have increased um, for all patients, but including, including ours with Parkinson's. Um, We've changed his medication slightly. What has happened now is where he would have gone into respite or into a day centre, the people that staff the day centre have started going in to visit the patients in their own homes, bringing a carer first to see if they need any shopping, and then going into the home, sitting with um, the patient for an hour, um, chatting, playing games, doing some exercise with them so the carer can have some... Um, um, a break from, from that awful relationship and, and the, the heightened strain um, that's put on the family relationships. So that's my last statement there, care of strain and burden has been heightened in all sorts of situations. Nurses are feeling extremely frustrated, fearful of where they're going to be redeployed and who's going to manage their, their Parkinson's patients. Um, anxiety about redeployment, huge decision-making um, choices, 
um, are they making the right decision because we're so used to having a face-to-face -face, um, consultation rather than a telephone consultation, especially when we've got a new patient that we may not have um, only have met once and haven't built up a, a working relationship with them. How can we judge what they're saying? Is it correct? Do we need support from the family or the spouse um, to, to ensure that we've got the right um, history from them to make the correct decision on their medication or referral to other services? And again, it's managing change. So I'll try and go through all these through my presentation. Right. So initially, when this started, when we, we went into um, stopping going into the community, because I'm based in a hospital, but I've got the privilege of doing uh, clinics in both hospital setting, a community setting, and going into patients' homes and care homes. So wherever our patient lives, we follow, the, follow them up. So in the beginning, we had a huge increase of calls, huge amount of anxiety of what the future is, what would they do if they contracted the, the illness, what would they do if they fell? Should they actually go to hospital? Our telephone consultations are much, much longer. I can be on the phone for a good half an hour to each of my patients. I've also had a lot of conversation with GPs because GPs have been ringing us when they've had, because they Skype in all their patients. And the GPs have said to me, yes, initially they had an awful lot of calls with lots of symptoms around cough and headaches and is it, is it COVID? But what they're noticing now is the calls have got less and less. And when the patient calls in with a problem, they're sicker because they've been ignoring underlying um, health problems because they're fearful of going to the GP. They're fearful of going to a and &E, of, 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 of contracting um, COVID from somebody else. So during the call, a lot of the time is explaining to what has happened in GP surgeries, what has happened in a and &E, so that we've got clean, and COVID areas, so patients will be stopped, stop, um, be safe, and we minimise any risk of, of infection. So we've changed all our clinics. We've kept all the clinic appointments as they were, and um, sent a le another letter up to the patients to say they will be receiving a telephone call from us, but don't hesitate to ring us in between if need be. Some of um, a, a, had Skype calls, which has worked out very well. Some it's been FaceTime on, on, a, on a mobile phone. We've been very proactive. Um, I've gone through my whole caseload, which is 500 plus patients, to make sure they're all going to have a call during this period. We've started with those who live alone to make sure that they've got somebody to do their shopping, that they're well. Every patient I see, I ask if they're well and are they symptom free. Um, have they got somebody to interact with and if they haven't we put them again through to the voluntary organisations and social services and looking after the frame to make sure that the, when the carers go in they're suitably um, using the correct PPE to pr prevent causing um, any cross infection to our patients. The care home patients in our area we've been extremely lucky and so far they've kept the virus out of the care homes but they're not admitting any new patients. There are a, a group of patients who may um, have been due to go into a care home or, or relatives are struggling um, with the intensity of care and they're not going into care at the moment. And a big, big problem is the respite care, as I, I've discussed earlier. Um, we're using email to contact patients. We have something called Patients Know Best, which is a patient record that they keep, and then they can securely message us and, and contact us with any problems. So with that, I can send out information sheets, information on exercise, and in, information on how to motivate yourself to prevent uh, your mood going. But what's really been positive, lots of patients have said they've gone out into the garden with their husbands and wives and they're distracted from the, from the um, situation the world is in by maintaining the garden, doing a little bit of exercise in the garden, painting, and things maybe they weren't allowed to do in the past, that the, the, the wife or the husband is, is giving them a little bit more freedom to be a little bit more autonomous and independent. Text messages have, have always worked, and they work especially with my younger patients. At the moment, if our, our team is two consultants and myself, so both consultants have been redeployed to full-time work on the wards. 
The physios have been redeployed as turning teams in ICU. Um, the occupational therapists are up on the wards trying to get patients discharged and going into the, the new nursing home that has opened for patients who have been discharged but can't go home along. So at the moment, it's me that has been managing the service, which is working quite well. But what I have done is delegated jobs to our secretary. So I don't take any calls. She fields the calls and then uh, message me, emails me um, with who has been calling, with their telephone number. And I've got a database that is live that I can look on about what symptoms they've had, what changes they've had to medication and what we can do. And she's sending out information sheets for me. So the advice to patients, reassurance has been huge. Stating our service will continue, we won't abandon them. Explaining GPs are still available and don't uh, ignore other underlying illnesses. However, as we know, lots of our patients ring us, we're our first point of contact. So they ring us asking, is this part of Parkinson's or should I go to the GP so we can um, advise them appropriately and reassure them they'll be safe. And again, explain about A&E, how it's split into two different areas of suspected COVID and other illnesses um, and screening. So they, they feel reassured that if something goes wrong, they can go to A&E. Um, I ask them specific questions. I have a little bit of a checklist that I go through, um, asking if they, they're maintaining self-isolation as per government. Are they well? Do they have any new symptoms which could possibly be the virus? Um, on what to do about it. Are their carers coping? So I speak to both the patient and their spouse. Who's managing the shopping? Who's managing medication? We've had a little bit of a problem with the blister packs as some um, pharmacists have stopped delivering. So families are, um, are taking this on board, but obviously speaking to the families to make sure they're giving the medication at the right time and it has been um, dispensed correctly and that has been a little bit of a problem for one of my patients uh, as he developed increased hallucinations and when I spoke to the granddaughter they put an extra cinemet in later in the day and wondered why he'd be, become a little bit more confused and disoriented and hallucinating. Positivity is really, really key to managing this. And as I said earlier, safe at home rather than stuck at home and all the other things that they can, they can do. My, mom, my parents are elderly and I've been FaceTiming those and they actually love it seeing what we're doing around the house. So I'm sure lots of patients are doing this with their families. Big use of voluntary organisations regarding telephone support and befriending, shopping, medication and anything else that is needed um, by, this, by the patient, such as care and repair. So if they need a bed lever on the bed, they're going in. Trying out new exercises, so it could be a chair-based based exercise, it would be starting um, gardening again and using raised beds rather than bending right down, um, new hobbies and acceptance. And I've asked them all to take time away of having the television on all day because as we know BBC and British news is rather negative um, and some of them are so fearful and, and, I, well, I, and from my perspective I'm in a semi-rural area so the, the, the crisis isn't quite as bad as in London but they think it's the same as London all over the UK. I've got a directory of local services and our secretary, I've, I've uh, we've put those together and our, our secretary has sent those out to all the patients as well. Um, and a lot of my patients are saying their neighbours have been fantastic um, and they've got together and they're all ringing people once a week um, so they, they're supporting each other in their own street. Um, they're also, I've got a group of ladies um, who are friends and they, they're ringing each other. One of them is taking turns to ring each other to see how they are and how they, they, they're um, coping. And mental health resources, which are key. Why isn't this working? Sorry. So symptom management. Obviously, um, we ask if there's been any change to their motor and non-motor symptoms and if there has, um, act upon it appropriately. A clear list of medications, so I ask them to read out their medication, whether they can pronounce it or not, so we know what they're taking and the times they're taking. 
because very often when there's been a change of, of symptom, I may have nipped to somebody's house, had a look at what's happening to their medication and found that there may have been a dispensing error and we, I could have quickly rectified that there and then. So we, it's important to know what's on the prescription. And when I've made any changes, I do a follow-up letter to both the patient and the GP explaining what changes in, in a clear format for the patients. But actually, I spoke to a community pharmacist and I've made changes to a patient um, and the GP wasn't quite clear. And all I then was decrease one medication, but they weren't sure if it was a decrease of all medication or just one. So being clear with what you're actually writing on a, on a change um, that we fax to the surgeries is key again. Ask them about wearing off symptoms and what they are, because sometimes it's very difficult to note what is tremor and what is dyskinesia. Um, if they can video it um, and just send it to, to me and I can look at it and then delete it, that is helpful as well. Again, asking if there's any falls, where in the house are they falls, are they freezing? Because the community occupational therapist is still visiting patients, district nurses are still visiting patients. And we have something called an acute um, ACT, acute community team, which is made up of um, consultant, nurse practitioners, and the full multidisciplinary team. And they're still going into patients. And they've been into two of my patients this week because they were quite poorly. And one actually was poorly, Nothing to do with her Parkinson's, um, ex um, but she'd been prescribed as a pain by her GP, became extremely constipated, became really drowsy and sleepy. Um, so the, the acute team, I suspect it was that, the acute team went in and then um, helped with any other resources that was needed in the house. Um, OT and physio assessment and within a few days they were back out and that patient and their husband were back to their normal uh, routine. There's some online um, resources, there's lots of them, Parkinson's UK is the, is, is the best that we have um, in the UK and it, it's an amazing resource for our patients but we have something called Silver Cloud um, which is an online resource um, patients but also staff can use that so nurses can use it if they're feeling rather anxious and mood zone is, is a welsh um, um online resource for uh, mental health visual hallucinations have been um quite um difficult to manage especially on patients who have only just developed them and, and trying to explain what they mean over the phone and Family, trying to explain to the family what they are and especially if a patient lacks insight into what the vis visual hallucination is and the paranoia and doesn't always recognize his wife as who, of who she is so trying to explain that so again the telephone consultations are taking much longer palliative care and end of life has been a huge challenge some of our patients have naturally come into the end of their disease progression and having a telephone call with them and their family and, and making that judgment call to, to involve the district nurse and the GP for the just in case box. They've got advanced clap planning in, in place, but to tell somebody over the phone that they're coming to the end of their journey of this disease has been very difficult. And again, it's following, follow, following those patients up and regular reviews. So my patients have come, come into end of life and I've lost a few patients during this last month. Um, I've had weekly um, telephone calls with a spouse um, and the district nurses have gone into manage and the Macmillan nurses, of course, but they still want your advice because some of the patients I've known for 17 years and it, it's been very distressing for all concerned and I've also told all the patients we're continuing to follow them up sometimes it will just be their next regular appointment sometimes it will be weekly sometimes it will be monthly depending on their symptoms and depending on their anxiety and their mental health how much more support they need during this time so the future I think we've got more questions and answers who knows how long this will last we don't, but I know we're starting to reopen some clinics and how do we make the situation we live in now the norm? Um, when can our home visits recommence? 
and what will our future service redesign be like? So I suspect we won't be seeing so many patients in our clinics, as Bar said, but we will be doing a lot more of remote consultations. But as nurses, we've got that privilege that we can go in and out. But being based in a hospital, it's difficult to go into the community. I think if I was purely community-based, I would be still seeing a lot more patients. Thank you very much. Was that okay? Sorry, just just unmuting myself. Yeah, no, th th it's, that, that was that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive um, review. One that you, there's a lot lot to discuss there, but one thing I just wanted to come straight back uh, about was the question of redeployment. Um, uh, certainly at a consultant level, that's been quite variable across the country. Uh, so so even in Scotland, where we haven't been redeployed. Some of our junior staff have. But I know that in other areas, it tends to be smaller hospitals where neurologists have been redeployed. Of course, a lot of the patient organisations, not just Parkinson's, but MND and other groups, have been very concerned about redeployment of nurse specialists. And you touched on this. Are you, what, what's the situation in, in Wales and England, if you know it? I mean, have many PD nurses been redeployed? Do you know? Yes, in some areas there's been quite a lot of redeployment, um, so the services have come to a complete standstill. In other areas, it's been some nurses have been redeployed for several days of the week, but they can retain their Parkinson services. I'm fortunate at the moment, I, I'm still doing my job full time, but I know I'm about to be redeployed. I've had an awful lot of upskilling. Um, but I've, I've, I've spoken to my managers and I can guarantee that I can keep two days a week for Parkinson's. So I work full time, so I'm three, three shifts a week on a ward and two days a week managing the Parkinson's um, patients. So I think it's key having secretary or administration support that they can um, take all the telephone calls and then they can give a patient a date and a time when you will call them back and deal with it. However, it's, if it's confusion, if it's visual hallucinations, we need to deal with it there and then. Okay, and a couple of questions coming in, Louise. So, so you, you, you partly touched on this one, but one question about whether you, use, whether you have a structured uh, interview system for your telephone consultations. You mentioned a checklist. I mean, is, is it sort of a combination of both or what, what do you tend to do? A bit of a combination. So I start off asking how they are. Do they have any symptoms? I talk about do they live alone? Who supported them? I talk about their shopping. So I've got a mental checklist. I haven't actually got a physical one, but I do know my colleague Jane Price in Powys. She's devised a checklist which she goes through every time. Um, so it's, it's all the basics, and then I come on to their Parkinson symptoms. So it's, it's make sure they're not look, oh, um, isolated, make sure their medication has been delivered, make sure they've got some sort of support, some shopping. Um, talk about the relationship in the house to make sure there is not this abusive relationship which I've come across, which I didn't know before. So it is, it is um, enlightening me on some of the situ home situations which maybe I've never asked about before. Um, but yeah, I do go through it, and I have did share it with share with the consultants because one of the consultants stayed initially doing some telephone calls and explained to him what I was doing, so he has been using it as well. But I think as long as you you've got that mental checklist in your mind that you are covering all the bases for all the patients. Yeah, and, and there's an interesting comment just just going back to the previous question about redeployment. So 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 someone's just mentioned that Parkinson's UK are keeping a, a track of this. Uh, and 54% of, of PD specialist nurses so far have been redeployed either entirely or partly, whether that, whether I, I guess that's UK wide, but that, that's a concern and that's something that we need to be aware of because whilst we're re we recognise the pandemic needs uh, many hands on deck, we also recognise there's a health service to run as well and, and, and that's important. Um, one, one, one last question, Louise, from, from, from someone. What, what, how would you deal with this sort of call? Sorry to put you on the spot, but here we are. So a patient who's been falling regularly at home uh, with more falls, mainly related due to inactivity. How, 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 would you, how would you approach that kind of problem? Okay, so I'd ask what their routine is during the day because I think routine helps. And, and lots of my patients have said getting into routine has, has helped. Um, ask them what type of exercise they've done in the past. Ask them if they're dizzy. Ask them how long they're sitting down. Are they sitting down all day and then when they get up, they're having a postural drop? 
explain about some chair exercises. I am fortunate with, with this ACE, this acute community team of physio can go in to reassess. So I can I have got the resource to enable community physios to go in and reassess patients. Um, but it is about exercising and getting to exercise. If they've got a spouse, encouraging the spouse to to not to um, take over and take control of their lives, but encourage them to do things. Um, I have sent a Zimmer frame up to somebody's house recently um, for them to use. Um, I'm talking through queuing exercises. Um, so, so yes, our telephone consultations take an awful long time, but you have to be more patient and try and visualize what the patient is doing and explain time and time again what they are doing and try to get them to exercise. But I have been sending out some exercise sheets which are visual so they can copy some of these um, sheets because they're all missing their exercise classes. They're missing social interaction um, with their, their Parkinson's groups. I have got some patients that are still in choirs and using Zoom. Um, to cry. So it would be quite nice if some of them could do to exercise or so something, a possibility that we could look at as a Parkinson's Nurse Association. Louise, thanks very much. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go, go back to Baz who, who wanted to make a comment or, or a, a contribution about the palliative care issue. Baz. Yeah, so many people are concerned that now, of course, um, these discussions about the most sensitive part of your Parkinson's journey, the end of life issues, are now brought forward. And I just wanted to emphasize that in a good care setting, you should discuss end of life issues regardless of intensive care unit capacity. The fact that your doctors are discussing end of life issues with you and asking you to think about your wishes in that difficult final phase is not because there is a lack of intensive care beds. It's part of regular good practice medicine. I discuss that, I've done that for 30 years in my life, with all my patients on an annual basis, asking them if your heart stops, do you wish to be resuscitated, knowing that your outcome will be probably worse than you entered the resuscitation? Do you want to go to an intensive care unit and spend weeks knowing that you will likely get out of the intensive care worse than you entered the intensive care? And I just wanted to emphasize this. This is part of good clinical practice. And I want, you, and I want to urge you to think about it now that you have a good breath now that your cognition is okay and that you're able to discuss it, discuss it with your spouse, discuss it with your GP, make sure you write it down because it always happens on a Friday night when a young trainee in his enthusiasm brings you to the intensive care unit where in hindsight, maybe you didn't never wanted to go there. So discuss it now, not because we lack capacity because it's good clinical practice. Uh, thanks, thanks very much indeed. And, and Louise, thank you very much for, for a comprehensive um, nursing perspective. So, so we shall turn to, to our, our, our final speaker, Francesca uh, Mancini um, from uh, Milan. Um, unfortunately, as we know, um, Italy has been particularly hard hit by the COVID-19. And for those of you who are a bit shaky on geography, Milan, of course, is in the north of the country. And I understand it's the north of the country in particular has suffered. And of course, uh, amongst that many of your deaths have been a disproportionate number of, of healthcare uh, professionals. Um, so, so our heartfelt um, uh, concern about that, uh, Francesca, but very interested to hear the Italian perspective in, in, in relation to Parkinson's. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Good afternoon to everybody. And yes, I will share my uh, Northern Italy perspective, but also the experience with telemedicine. Now I share my work okay because uh, actually uh, i have been working on a telemedicine uh, project dedicated to parkinson disease for one year and now with the covid 19 outbreak uh, our job and our work has been uh, really uh, increasing every day Thank you to Professor Bloom and to Mrs. Ebenezer because they already uh, said everything about the gaps uh, in Parkinson's disease management, also 
um, before uh, COVID outbreak and uh, um, what is happening now and what uh, Parkinson disease nurse specialists can do in this specific moment. Uh, what um, I will tell you now about Italy, uh, COVID in Italy and about my experience is what this particular uh, new model of telenursing because we developed this uh, nursing telecare model as I told you earlier it, it has been working for one year now and the um, uh, the focus of this model is that it is constituted by a Parkinson disease a specialized nurse. And in Italy, we do not have and we did not have uh, nurses specialized in Parkinson disease. So the first uh, issue and the first uh, um, job has been to uh, train nurses to become expert in Parkinson disease and movement disorders. And this happened, thank you, the help of uh, UK nurses and uh, Sue Thomas in particular and uh, Parkinson Academy. Uh, so we, uh, first of all, worked on uh, this um, training with the nurses in particular. We worked on uh, the gaps in the management of Parkinson disease with movement disorder specialists, uh, not only from Italy, but also from, uh, from um, uh, Abroad, for example, Bas Plum helped us and is a, a consultant of our. And now, uh, then, we have been able to um, to to have this uh, model working. And I will um, I will tell you that this is a very unique and new experience in Italy. So at the beginning, it has not been easy to to work and to um, convince patients uh, first of all that this kind of telenursing, this kind of care, is is useful. Uh, Parkinson care uh, works with uh, a, a PD um, nurse specialist uh, and a digital platform able to integrate all the information about patient, uh, not only about the disease, Parkinson disease, but also lifestyle and uh, environment, his particular and um, individual environment. And the other um, characteristic is that is, uh, it, it is a daily approach. So the nurses can get in touch with patients every day. Uh, this is a, not a video uh, nursing, but a telenursing because during the last year, actually uh, we did not need video nursing because patients could uh, anyway get to the visits, neurological visits, and also patients normally had the uh, access to their treatment and services. But now during the COVID time, uh, as I will tell you later, we have integrated this, uh, this kind of care with the, the video support. So the Parkinson care works with um, um, expertise in Parkinson disease and daily care and uh, with um, a, a pathway, a journey that the patient once enrolled uh, make with the nurse. Uh, the first time that the patient uh, get in contact with uh, the service, the nurse perform what we call enrollment phase, which uh, is a questionnaire of uh, 66 questions interviewing about uh, personal uh, family medical history, treatments, comorbidities, but most of all, lifestyle and uh, family life arrangements. Uh, because we, um, even if by phone and not by video, uh, we are trying to get in touch and to know patient's environment as much as possible. And this happens also with the help of um, 
um, uh, clinical scale scores approved for Parkinson's disease. Uh, first of all, non-motor non uh, symptoms scale adapted to be used on the phone and some parts of UPDRS and the SCOPA scales. Once that the nurse and the um, patient got in touch and know each other, for all the journey, the, the same patient will have always the same nurse and they together plan the care plan. They identify together the major issues of uh, the patient disease and health, major health problems related to Parkinson's disease, motor or non-motor, and they together uh, decide how to face them day by day. Uh, to perform this, we also created some um, uh, a series of triage. Triage are uh, algorithm uh, supported by the platform that the nurse can use to um, uh, better uh, deep and understand patients' problems and symptoms. And the, uh, the triage, these algorithm are supported by uh, validated scale scores for uh, scales for Parkinson disease and also of course their their use is up to nurse experience and judgment but uh, the possibility to use the algorithm um, is um, it's a kind uh, it's about like the checklist that uh, uh, Louise was talking before. It's like that the nurse has a kind of checklist to follow, but of course, during the, per the performance of the algorithm and of the questions, the nurse is always able to understand uh, what the patient is, uh, is saying in that moment and uh, if there are particular problems that are not included uh, in the algorithm. Uh, with these uh, 14 algorithms that they will be integrated in the next month, we try to face the um, principal major problems, uh, uh, motor and non-motor problems of uh, Parkinson disease. And another important moment of this uh, care plan is the coaching uh, that the nurse perform for the pre-visit. Uh, we know that sometimes people with Parkinson's disease, when they come to the neurological visit, they forget uh, many things that they would have liked to say, but they, um, for emotion or because the time it is too short, they are not able to go through all the issues. So a few days before the visit, the nurse go through all the issues and the problems and the, the triage that they have made during the last month to help the patients to be exhaustive during the visit. Uh, during all these steps, anytime it is needed, the nurse um, inform the uh, GP or the neurologist, it depends on the uh, type of problem, about what is happening. One of the characteristics of this uh, service is integration and coordination. So um, it is very important for us to be able to get in touch with the neurologist and the uh, GP of the patient, because in some cases in Italy, nurses are not able to prescribe or change uh, uh, therapies, drugs. So they cannot manage some issues and some problems that require changing of um, medicines, for example. So in these cases, the nurse send a report, a written report with a summary of the problems to the neurologist and alert the neurologist that the patients need an earlier consultation or a call to change, uh, to change the therapy. Well, last year, uh, we have been working with uh, 70 patients. Uh, that had a lot of contacts with the nurses and they performed the uh, uh, triage with the, the algorithm for specific issues that we will see in a moment. But um, 
many, many contacts were um, dedicated to caregiver support, to coaching, to um, educational health uh, issues. Uh, other than information, self-management, and different problems that are out of the algorithm, but are uh, has been very important. We uh, had to do both with patients and caregiver. Mo most of, uh, most of the time with patients, but um, several caregivers interacted with us. Mainly uh, caregiver of patients with cognitive impairment, of course. So the caregiver was uh, was the ones that called us. Um, uh, Thirteen percent of the contacts concern new symptoms triage. So what happened was that patients with new symptoms, uh, facing new problems and new symptoms, uh, not able to uh, contact the neurologist, um, were, were able to call us and manage um, uh, in, in the correct way the new symptoms with the nurse. Uh, referral to neurologists was necessary in 37% of cases. That means that most of the time the nurses were able to um, uh, happily uh, manage uh, the problem of the patient. And in a very low percentage of cases, uh, we had to uh, involve other um, other physicians. Uh, the most of the time, uh, here you can see um, the most frequent symptoms that the re um, required a triage. Uh, a triage means uh, that the the patient called the nurse because the onset of the wor or of the worsening of a new symptom. And so constipation, falls, freezing, uh, depression and anxiety were the most uh, frequent symptoms. Uh, uh, as we can imagine, because this is not different from what we see in our usual practice, most frequent uh, non-motor symptoms in our po population, in our patients, were uh, daytime sleepiness and fatigue or apathy, but fatigue um, from the scale. And the most disabling symptoms were dysphagia and constipation. Well, this is what we did till uh, March 11th. Then uh, we had the outbreak, um, we had pandemic. As you know, as you said, Northern Italy has been involved since the beginning and the situation rapidly got uh, really, really bad in terms of um, physician involved and called to, um, to be on duty in the COVID wards. And first of all, um, other uh, specialties like cardiologists, anesthetists, but, but rapidly neurologists as well were called to be on duty in COVID. So um, they were not more uh, reachable and available neither, uh, of course, on person for patients because uh, uh, outpatient clinics have been closed earlier, but uh, even if not uh, enough earlier, but um, at, at the half of March, uh, March uh, neurology clinics uh, has been closed, but um, um, rapidly uh, or neurologists were not reachable anymore or, or most of them actually not not one and of course unfortunately some some of them died so the our service uh, really got uh, a rapid and huge increase of calls also because we became free and we started to uh, enroll patients from all over italy uh, not only from 
the majority of cases from northern Italy, but also from all over Italy, uh, because the situation resulted in a really bad lack of care for persons with Parkinson's disease, not only um, uh, regarding the uh, possibility to contact the neurologist, but also because these patients with the lockdown were locked at home and uh, they had to interrupt the physiotherapy and all all the motor and non-motor activities that they were used to do. Uh, and, um, rapidly we were able to um, join with the major Italian Patients Association of Parkinson's Disease and uh, with uh, a major public hospital which, uh, which is the Neurological Institute Besta here in Milan. And so we were able to coordinate a network of PD specialists that now with video um, consulences were able to uh, remotely take care of all our patients. Uh, the, the nurses daily went on to take care of motor and non-motor symptoms issues, onset of new complication, patients' education, but now also take care of coordination of the multidisciplinary network and also the coordination of the local services. Uh, I have to say that in this situation, the, the picture is similar to what happened before, before the COVID outbreak. Uh, the difference is that in one month, we had to enroll 265 new patients. So uh, we were used to work with a much uh, smaller number of patients. Now we had uh, this increase of number of patients and so we modified a little bit the way of approach to the patients. The enrollment phase became smaller and faster and we focused on the triage algorithm to better answer to patients' questions and uh, patients' problems. Anyway, problems of Parkinson's disease remain uh, always the same uh, also during uh, COVID um, lockdown. So freezing, constipation, anxiety, pain were the um, most frequent symptoms declared and claimed by our patients. Uh, and um, we, um, what we had to do uh, actually uh, differently from before the COVID outbreak was to organize the, um, a pretty good number of video physiotherapies because one of the problems of the, uh, of the lockdown was the um, stop of the motor activity, uh, both physiotherapies and uh, general motor activity. And so patients refer the worsening of motor function other than mood, of course, and anxiety. And so um, video consultation with uh, psychologists and physiotherapists are more, uh, the most required, uh, more required than video, video consultations with um, the neurologists as well. So this is uh, more or less the pictures of what was happening before and during our Italian COVID uh, um, outbreak. I could tell you some histories about patients, but I don't know if I still have time or not. Let me know. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe five minutes, Francesco, is that all right? Excuse me? Uh, maybe, maybe five minutes, is that okay? Uh, five minutes, okay, okay, thank you. Right. Sorry, sometimes the line is not optimal. So I can, I can tell you, maybe it's more interesting, a couple um, or, or more cases that happened. Uh, for example, um, as I told you, several patients uh, have suffered from the interruptions of motor activities and started to, to complain, not really immediately, but after two, three weeks from the, um, from the lockdown, uh, they have started to complain about the uh, consequences of this uh, uh, interruption of the motor activities. First of all, pain, dystonic pain, uh, 
uh, worsening of the wearing of phases and constipations. And uh, we have learned how many patients um, do not know or very little about uh, um, education, nutritional information and uh, hygienic information about how to manage constipation, even uh, without uh, medicines eventually. So the nurses were able to help these patients with um, suggestions and advices without uh, the need to change or introduce medication. Um, several patients uh, started and are starting now to suffer for um, worsening of mood. I absolutely agree with what Louise and Bas said. Um, they were very good in the first days, first couple of weeks, but now uh, the, they cannot go on uh, much longer to be isolated and to, to stay so close with the rest of the family. They are not used to this kind of way. In Italy, we, even in the northern of Italy, we used to, to live out side uh, a lot even if it's true that people with Parkinson disease uh, tend to stay at home more than other people and maybe this is one of the reasons um, why they maybe do not get sick of COVID syndrome so much or less than what we expected it would have been happened. Anyway, um, and our nurses uh, gave health education advices and were able to manage well and solve many problems without the need of uh, neurological or GP consultations. Um, and, and another frequent case is uh, the one um, uh, like the one of uh, as Mr. St. Uh, with a recent uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, uh, who were able to undergo exams uh, before the lockdown, but then he had um, the exam, the prescribed exams made, but no one able to uh, give a feedback to him and explain if he had the disease or not and, and what was happening. In these cases, the nurse uh, was able to provide the proper health advices, but they asked uh, to neurologists that are collaborating with us, myself and other colleagues, to talk with the patient. And this kind of uh, consultation is really um, suitable to do also by telephone uh, without the video consultation because in most cases it's just a check of exams and so even we didn't know these patients it was easy to help them properly I have to say uh, and I, uh, a, a tough case that happened a few days ago was about Mr. Um, Marco, let's call him this way. Uh, first of all, um, the wife called reporting a worsening of his depression and that he was uh, re reporting uh, suicide ideas. So we were very worried about the situation. Um, this was not the first time it happened, but the lockdown situation exacerbated his, uh, his problems. So we, the nurse, uh, uh, promptly informed the psychiatrist and the neurologist. And so they collaborated in the management of the patients. But what was the, um, very good and successful idea of the nurse was to ask the patient to write an email her daily uh, some uh, um, writings about uh, joyful episodes of his life, of his previous life, but also um, moments of serenity in during this uh, during this period and so he was able to to do this and every day is uh, still now writing to the nurse uh, telling uh, writing about his days and uh, gardening and uh, 
calls with the nephew and relatives. And, and so we were able to manage the situation without the need by the psychiatrist to change the therapies or uh, worse, the need to uh, hospitalize the patient. Uh, that in this period is not really uh, proper. Um, what uh, uh, we are doing anyway when it's really needed, we have identified uh, two um, neurological institutes with uh, uh, words dedicated to Parkinson's disease that are cleaned from COVID by now in the north of Italy because if, uh, if it happens that we identify a patient that really badly needs to be hospitalized uh, maybe for for a few days for example to change the, um, the battery of the dbs or for issues regarding duodopa and infusion therapies we have created a safe uh, path to get uh, to the hospitalization um, in the most of the cases we are able to uh, solve the problems with video consultations and with the BESTA Institute, um, we have a standardized procedure to, uh, to make the telemedicine uh, by the neurologist. That's it. Francesca, thank you very much indeed. Um, that was a very comprehensive and, and detailed. And, and I, one, one, one suspects that like, like many other things, there is a silver lining to all of this. And perhaps if this kind of thing becomes more widespread, if it sort of accelerates the acceptance and involvement and rolling out of this, that will be something. Um, you won't be entirely surprised to hear that there's a fairly common theme coming through in the questions. Everybody wants your algorithms. <laughs> which, which is which is something we, we 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 shall discuss with you offline, and we'll 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 see what we can we can do about that. Um, but thank you very much in, in, indeed for that 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 really detailed uh, assessment, and it'd be great to hear more about that in in due course and how things uh, evolve. Um, I'm aware that that, that that time is passing by, so I was going to bring this to a close. Uh, in fact, and and really just to thank. Uh, all our three speakers, uh, three excellent talks, all with different perspectives uh, and very interesting indeed. Thank you very much indeed to Sarah and the Parkinson's Academy and Bayal for helping facilitate this. Most importantly, as always, thank you very much to all of you. I know that we've got some questions here that we haven't quite got round to resolving, but Sarah and I will, will work on these and get some answers to you. Uh, and the whole thing has been recorded. Um, so thanks very much. Um, we hope. Uh, to maybe uh, have some more of these. So keep a careful eye on the website um, uh, and what we can come up with. Tell your friends uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, indeed. But uh, for now, we shall say goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.